Hello and welcome to the field installation instructional video for the Metric Halo 3D upgrade for the ULN2. In this video, we're going to take you through all the steps needed to physically install the upgrade in your box. We recommend watching this video at least once through in advance to know what's involved before you do the installation. Then when you're ready, just follow along, take it nice and slow, and we'll be up and running with 3D in no time. Let's get started. There is no soldering involved in this upgrade and no special tools are required other than a Phillips head screwdriver, a small flathead screwdriver, a 7 64th inch hex wrench, and a small pair of needle nose pliers. And of course some trays for organizing all the various screws we'll be removing. I'll be using a power screwdriver to make things go a bit faster. This is optional, but if you choose to use one, just be sure that when putting screws back in, you have it set to the lowest drive setting possible, unless otherwise noted. Let's take a look at what comes with the 3D upgrade kit and make sure that we have everything we need ready to go. So we have 3D baseboard with pre-installed CPU module, MH clock board, and rubber feet on the bottom, new back panel, bridge board to connect the 3D board to our analog board, foam cap for the bridge board, new side panel extrusion with grooves for accommodating edge cards, edge card, 7 64th inch hex wrench. If you're updating multiple units, we recommend doing them one at a time, as each kit has components that are uniquely serialized for that kit, so you want to avoid mixing up the parts between upgrade kits. In particular, we want to make sure that the serial number on the 3D card matches the serial number on your back panel. So we want our unit to be fully powered down and to have no power or any other connections hooked up. The first step is to remove any rack ears you have connected to the box and set them aside together with their screws. In order to get the original masterboard out and have space to work with, we're going to need to take the front panel off. So to begin that process with our needle nose pliers, loosen up the ring nut around the headphone jack and twist it off. Next we need to pull off the six front panel knobs and set them aside. Now be patient with these knobs, they can sometimes be stubborn. In some cases a knob may come off easy by just grabbing with your fingers and pulling the knob right off. Some may be extra tight though. If you struggle getting these off, I promise this is the toughest part and the rest should be easy. We want to get them off without damaging the knobs. What we can do is take a flathead screwdriver, the skinnier the better, and with your forearm resting on top of the front edge for support, see if you can very slowly, very gently get it behind the knob and gently pry it as you pull the knob toward you. Once the knobs are off and set aside, with pliers, loosen and twist off the six hex nuts that sit behind the rubber knobs. Now let's remove the screws for the side panel extrusions. These are the screws in the four corners of the unit, front and back. If using a power screwdriver, the torque may need to be higher to get these out. I'm setting mine to five. These corner screws are longer than the screws in the rest of the unit. It's very important that when we put everything back together, that these longer screws go back in the corners and not in the middle, otherwise they can damage the front panel meter board. So we'll keep these screws together, separated from the rest. Next, we'll pull off the two side panels, and we're going to choose one to discard and one to keep. It doesn't really matter which one you keep, maybe if one has a scratch or something, you can discard that one. Then take the one you're going to keep, and put it together with the new one, and we'll explain later how they need to line up when they go back on the box. Next, we'll remove the smaller hex screws across the top of the front of the unit, four of them.
Then on the back, there are two more screws on the top we need to remove for the top panel to come off. And we'll remove and set aside the top panel for now. There are four more screws on the bottom front to take off to detach the front panel. Then we can detach the front panel ribbon cable from the master board like so. And now the front panel and ribbon cable staying together can be set aside. Next we're going to remove the rest of the back panel. So with our same tool we've been using so far, we'll remove the remaining two hex screws on the bottom of the back panel, and one more of these screws in between the two ADAP ports. We'll put these with our other small case screws. Now with your needle nose pliers, we'll begin to loosen up the ring nuts and then twist them the rest of the way off. Some may come off a bit easier than others, just have patience with these. There are eight altogether we need to remove and set aside. Then we have several more screws to remove with our Phillips head screwdriver. Four around the analog input jacks. Two around the four pin XLR power connector in the middle. and five around the SPDIF and AES connectors. These last five will not be needed later, but keep the rest of these screws set aside together. And now the old back panel should slip right off. Looking at it from overhead, we can see the analog board, this larger board on the bottom, with the little switchboard here. These are going to stay in place. We're going to be focused on this area here, removing the legacy master board and 2D board. Before we do that, we'll detach the ADAT opto board and ribbon cable from the 2D board, and we're going to want to hang on to this ADAT board and cable as it will be going back in later. When we pull these two boards out, they may pop out still attached to each other, or they may come out separately. It doesn't really matter. The master board down here on the bottom is connected to three metal posts coming up from the bottom panel metal. It's typically not necessary, but if the legacy master board is particularly hard to get off, these posts can be narrowed with a small pair of pliers, just enough to allow the board to pop off. So we'll rock the 2D board back and forth, getting it loose from the pins on the analog board. And we can put a hand under the master board and pop it off those bottom posts. Then if necessary, reach further under and pop it off some more and eventually that whole assembly will come out and we can set it aside. Now we're ready to place down our new 3D baseboard assembly. We can see the processing module should already be in place and our word clock and MH link ports that will face the back of the unit. The same metal posts on the bottom metal will line up with the holes on the board and we'll want to make sure this pops into place securely on all three posts. Now we're going to take our 3D bridge board for connecting the new card with the existing analog board. The orientation of this bridge board is absolutely critical. Notice the lip that hangs over one side with writing on it. This lip must be facing toward the back of the unit toward the USB-C connector. There are two rows of pins on either side. We want to carefully line them all up with our bridge board, 
and once we can tell it's fitting smoothly, we can firmly press down so that the pins are no longer exposed. Again, this needs to be lined up perfectly. We don't want any bent or misaligned pins. Next, let's reattach the meter board to the pins on our 3D board that are right behind it. And make sure that's nice and lined up. Then we can slide this back over the front and replace the four small hex screws that go on the bottom. Next, we'll slide the new 3D back panel on. You can loop it over the XLR release tabs, then get it nice and flush and replace the two small hex screws on the bottom. Now let's take our little ADAT Opto board and attach its cable on the matching pins toward the back of the 3D card on the inside corner. doors of the ADAT ports facing out, and we can replace the screw that goes between the ADAT ports so they're secured in place. At this stage, before we finish reassembling the unit, let's test it out. We'll attach power, and on the front panel we're looking for the power and locked LEDs to come on. And this would indicate that our 3D upgrade has been successful. If you get no lights on the front panel when you power on, or any other unexpected behavior after carefully following the preceding video, please contact us at our support email address with the subject 3D Field Upgrade. We'll turn the unit off by unplugging power. Next, we can proceed in reassembling the rest of the unit by replacing two of the threaded Phillips head screws around the 4-pin XLR power connector and four around the analog input connections. Then we have our eight ring nuts on the back, which you can tighten by hand most, if not all the way. Back in front, we'll put the six hex nuts that sit behind the rubber knobs back on and tighten them just a touch, not too tight. Same for the last ring nut for the headphone jack. Then we'll push the knobs back on. Notice the semicircle shape inside the knob matches the shape of the post. So just turn it until it lines up and give it a push until it's back in place. Before we put the top cover back on, we want to take our piece of foam with an adhesive strip on it, just peel off the paper to reveal the sticky side, and place that sticky side right down on top of the bridge board. Just give it a little press, and when the top cover goes on, it'll press down on this foam a bit to ensure that the bridge board doesn't walk off. And just check to make sure you don't have any stray screws or small bits of loose debris anywhere inside the unit. You can use canned air here or just blow it out. Now we can add back the top panel. The two holes are to the back and the four holes to the front. Line it up with the holes in front and back and we'll use our small screws here to secure the top cover. 
Again, make sure these are not the longer screws we're saving for the side panels. Lastly, we have our side panel extrusions, which need to go on in a particular way. So earlier, we put one of the older ones together with our new one, and if we look on the inside of them, we can see the grooves where one side is thicker than the other. We want the holes for the rack ears toward the front of the unit, and specifically for the side that the 3D card and edge bus are on, we want the thicker portion of the inside metal on top. That's going to allow everything to fit properly. So with the side panels in place, we can screw in our eight longer hex screws in the four corners front and back. If you're using a power screwdriver, this is the one time when you'll need to raise the torque to get the screws to go in. I'm going to raise mine up to five. Now we can take our edge card and note the rubber feet on the bottom. We just want to place it inside the hole in the back and let the rubber feet track along the bottom and then push right into the edge bus on the 3D card. And it should basically become flush with the back panel and pop into place. Then we can just turn the screws to tighten it in place and use a screwdriver for the area where it's a bit tight. If you have any questions about any steps in the preceding video or run into any problems, please reach out by emailing support at mhsecure.com with the subject 3D Field Upgrade.